let me kind of kick things off here. Again, uh, my name is Eric Oje. I'm the Director of Research and Development here at American Business Systems, and I'm just going to kind of kick you off right out here this afternoon, and, and uh, let's get this show on the road. We're going to be talking about why should doctors outsource their billing? Now, folks, uh, obviously, that's a great question because, first of all, we already know that doctors are already doing billing, and if some of them may be doing billing in their own office, they may have a staff that's doing billing, so why would a doctor ever want to outsource it to you? And then why would a doctor want to outsource in the first place? And there's no better person to ask and answer that question than, again, Dr. Vicki Racker. And that's what you're going to, again, be uh, really enjoying uh, this afternoon. Who is American Business System? Well, it's an organization that's been here for 25 years, folks. That's a, that's a good longevity as you're starting to look for a business opportunity. Uh, 25 years we've been, uh, over the past 25 years, working with folks just like yourself, helping them get involved as an independent medical revenue management company. Yeah, I said medical revenue management, not just medical billing, because as you're here from Dr. Vicki Ragnar this afternoon, it's more than just doing the billing. One of the things we'd love for you to do is come by our office here. Come visit with us. We are conveniently located in Fort Worth, Texas. For those that would like to fly in, you'd fly into the Dallas-Fort Worth area, and uh, we'll give you our address, which is 5751 Kroger Drive in Fort Worth. You can look that up on the internet and know that we're actually in this particular building. So we'd love for you to come on by and visit with us. What is the heart behind everything that we're doing? is the billing platform that I'm showing you right now. The iClaim, the EMRX billing platform, it's a complete web-based system, 100% integrated with each other. You just need one system, you don't need multiple systems. It just keeps it simple. And that's what's helping us get these doctors paid. Now, the person that's going to be interviewing Dr. Vicki Ragnar is Patrick Phillips. He's our founder and the CEO. Yes, he and his wife over 25 years ago began doing medical billing and that turned into the family business as we know it as American Business Systems. And we call it American Business Systems. As you'll see, there's just more than just the medical billing. He's also over the years been becoming a best-selling author. He's working on these books. Uh, these books are already out. You can find any of these books on Amazon.com. He's actually working with some other uh, books that he's working on in conjunction with Dr. Vicki Rackner. If I tell you all of that, then he would absolutely not like all that but, but out there. But he is working on some of those books, and that is good news for you. Also, we've got the magazine, the Billing and Coding Advantage magazine, which he is a, a contributing uh, editor uh, on that for di many different uh, parts there. And really, without any further ado, I'm going to get Patrick on here and let him kind of take it from here and let him introduce uh, Dr. Vicki Racker. Patrick, good to see you today, sir. Yes, thank you, Eric. Well, this is exciting because, uh, folks, this is your chance to hear from uh, a doctor. I mean, a real medical doctor who has been there and done that and has the T-shirt <laughs> because Dr. Vicki Ragnar actually outsourced her billing uh, when she was in uh, general practice. And so uh, we have the privilege of hearing directly from well, I hate to say the horse's mouth, that's not a good way to put it, but anyway, directly from her uh, as to why it's good that doctors do outsource their billing. Now, before I introduce her, let me just give you this quote here. This is a good one to know, that the global medical outsourcing market is projected to register a compound annual growth rate of about 10 and a half percent during the forecast period, which was 2018 to 2023. So folks, any industry in the United States that's growing at 10% uh, annual, that, that's just unbelievable. Uh, and that's because medical billing, uh, I should say the medical industry, is uh, about 20% of our you know, uh, gross, domestic, gross domestic products. So uh, I think it's good that you know that at least if you do get into our business, that you're in uh, the right business. It's growing fast. And here's another quote, HIT consultant. Uh, the revenue cycle management market currently valued at 20.5 billion is estimated to reach 40.4 billion by 2021. So folks, in just a short period of time, as you can see, this could double in value as far as the number of dollars generated in this industry. So again, if you're picking an industry, a, a business to start, this is a good one to get started. Now, let me introduce Dr. Vicki, and we'll get her on here live here in a second. 
Dr. Vicki uh, is a retired general surgeon. She was in practice for many, many years, saw thousands of patients, and uh, of course thrived in her own medical practice. She's now working with medical uh, billers like yourself through our company uh, to help them uh, connect with doctors. She's written many, many books. You can see her on the screen. Uh, she's been interviewed on a lot of different programs, uh, radio, TV, and in magazines all across the United States. She's a fellow of the American College of Surgeons, and she is a contributing editor to Physicians Money Digest and the Medical of Journal, uh, the Journal of Medical Practice Management. So she's also a board member, by the way, of the Medical Revenue Management Association of America, which was established by my son, Adam, uh, because we wanted to establish a company and an organization that would actually certify people like yourself. So when you go through our training here in Dallas, you're certified by Murma as a certified medical revenue manager. So let's get Dr. Vicki on the show here today and, and talk with her live. Dr. Vicki, you there? I am so nice to be here with you, Patrick. Well, Dr. Vicki, I wanted to start with a quote from your book here. I'm going to put that up on the screen. And this is your latest book. Uh, well, I know you're working on another one we're going to talk about, but uh, The Myth of the Rich Doctor. You know, when I first saw this, uh, I thought, well, that's an interesting title. Uh, why would you come up with a book that's about the myth of the rich doctor? Aren't all, all doctors rich? Well, it's a myth, Patrick. All doctors have very high incomes. They have the potential to develop wealth, which I think of as the freedom to do what they want to do when they want to do it. But only about half of doctors today are where they'd like to be in retirement planning. So there are 65 year old doctors who are thinking, well, gee, I might be able to retire when I'm 80. So I just wanted to sit down and tell the truth about doctors and their relationship with money. And you know what? I bet that people on this line would enjoy reading this book. Can we just uh, give it to them as a digital download and they can learn a little bit about doctors and their relationship with money? I don't know. Eric, can you do that? You bet we can. I'm going to put it over in the handouts. Uh, so I'm going to grab that and put that out there in the handouts right now. Well, you'll okay, find yeah. it. It's a very easy read and doctors love this book. But I think that this book is going to give you some insight about why it is that medical revenue managers are key, a uh, key to success. I know when you speak at different conventions for doctors all over the country, uh, they flock when they hear the title of this uh, speech that you give based on this book, don't they? They sure do. It's kind of funny. I was I write all the time and I was just looking through the number of views and shares and things like that. And this this single blog post, The Myth of the Rich Doctor, got about a hundred times as many views as even my most popular blog post. So I don't know what it is about this, but some kind of magic has happened and this is something that really catches doctors' attention. <laughs> well, I, I took a quote right out of the book here that I wanted to read to folks here. You see it on the screen there, folks. Uh, physicians in private practice walk away from an average of 30% of their income when they do not follow up on rejected insurance claims. Now that's part of what you'll be doing for doctors is helping with our system. It automatically makes sure that a lot of those claims go through that wouldn't go through normally. Our rejection rate is less than 2%. So you compare that with a 30% and uh, it can be a, a, a great income uh, uh, increaser for, for the doctor's office. It says, uh, and she goes on to say, outsourcing your medical billing could bring uh, rejection rates to as low as two to 5%. This may be the fastest and easiest way to increase your cash flow. So folks, that's why this book is a great marketing tool for you as one of our licensees, because when the book, uh, the doctors read this from another doctor, you see, uh, it means a whole lot more than if they just hear it from you. That's right. And the, the other thing that I just wanna point out about the myth book is you might think, well, gee, if you've got a doctor who's unhappy, who's maybe thinking about selling their practice, you might think, well, why don't I do this simple and easy thing to sort of turn my financial performance of my practice around. But the fascinating thing about doctors is they often don't even think of this as a solution. They're saying, gee, my cash flow is slow. I've got to pay that college tuition. What am I going to do? Well, why don't I just see more patients? Instead of sort of stepping back and asking the question, well, are there smarter ways 
that I might be able to make some changes that would really help me get back to the personal and professional and financial goals that attracted me to a career in medicine. So you today might know more about how to run a successful practice than most doctors know. Yeah, some of the questions we're going to go over, I should say some of the points that we're going to go over come from a new book that Dr. Vicki is writing right now, which will be a marketing tool for our licensees called 10 Critical Questions for Physicians in Private Practice. Uh, how I got rid of stress in me and my staff, cut my overhead dramatically and work less hours and increase my revenue. This is a tremendous book, folks. I've already seen, of course, the, the manuscript for this. She's in the process of finishing up, so it's not on the market yet, but it will be out there soon and you'll be able to use it and give it away as a nice little uh, gift to doctors to educate them. And uh, Dr. Vicki, I think this is gonna open up some eyes of, of the doctors out there. Well, I do too. And, you know, I, I just like to have conversations with my readers. And I, I'm so grateful that you invited me to think about this project because I thought about my own history. I call myself an accidental surgeon. I was actually in a graduate program when I had a surgical emergency myself. I was bleeding internally. And by the time I got to the operating room, about half of my blood volume was in my pelvis. So I thought this was kind of the end. And I was so grateful to be alive that I knew I was going to be a doctor and save other patients' lives like my own had been saved. And I also knew enough about myself to know that I, I didn't want to be somebody else's employee. You know, I wanted to run my own show. But, you know, just getting out of medical school and residency with $100,000 in debt, I thought, well, maybe I should just partner up with somebody and get my feet below me. So I joined another solo practitioner, and he was delighted to have me because he could finally share call. We just shared expenses, and um, a funny thing happened. He had this office manager who had been with him forever. And a couple months after I joined the practice, she gave in her letter of resignation. And well, I've got some ideas about why that happened, but we need to find somebody else. But, but the problem was we could just hire a temporary person, but this woman had done the billing too. So my partner's wife said, how hard could billing be? And she said, I'll just take some time for my test game and come on in and do the billing. And oh, it took, my goodness. Yeah, it took <laughs> her a couple of weeks before she finally decided she had drastically underestimated the extent of the challenge. And um, things got really, really far behind. We had to make an owner investment in order to pay our quarterly taxes, which, which meant that, you know, all of our bills, you know, we weren't getting money out of the practice. We were have to, having to put money into the practice. Um, well, not long after I had an opportunity to really break out on my own. And the very first decision I made about going solo was that I was going to outsource my billing. I knew that things happen to people. People get sick. They, you know, people have to move away to take care of a mother or mother-in-law but I never wanted anything bad to happen to my cash flow if something happened to my office staff. So that is the first decision I made. And in retrospect, I think it's the best decision that I made that really set me up for success. And this book that Patrick just showed you um, really talks about 10 questions that doctors in private practice might wanna ask themselves if they wanna achieve high levels of performance and talk about how outsourcing my billing was really the foundation for success. Yeah, even though uh, the book doesn't say on the cover anything about the outsourcing, we don't, we don't wanna uh, oversell it. It does tie in with many of the questions and uh, that she poses in the book. So what we've done is we've taken those questions and uh, reworded them here for this webinar so that it makes sense to you, somebody looking to get into outsourcing the, the billing for doctors. Uh, like this one here, let's start with number one. Doctors uh, should use the right person uh, to get the job done right. What, what does that relate to, Dr. Vicki? Well, I am a study of high performance. 
And if you look at people who achieve high levels of performance, whether it's in athletics or business performance, they know what they do well and they get the right person to get the job done. So I knew that the job that I wanted to do in my practice was take good care of patients. I didn't really care about the money, to be quite honest with you. In fact, I just used to bring my checks home and my husband used to take care of the money. I cared about taking good care of patients. All right, if my office staff were responsible for doing the outsource billing, that would mean that I would have to manage that task. And that would take away from my core expertise and my core interest, which is patient care. So early on, I decided that just like I get an expert to do my taxes, I wanted an expert to do my billing because I really understood how important this billing issue was and how important the cash flow was. And by the way, when I was worried about money, it kind of colored my whole day. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where you've got financial stresses, but oh, nothing yeah. is the same. You just carry it around like a weight on your shoulder all day, every day. So I wanted to make sure that that was tucked in so that I could really turn my attention to things that I did best. Yeah, and I don't think most doctors uh, give that any thought. If they're doing the billing in-house with their own staff using their own software, they don't really think about the fact that they are probably not collecting everything that they could be collecting from the insurance companies because, uh, I mean, they get checks in, you know, probably every day from some insurance company. So they're going, okay, well, I've got cash flow, but they don't realize that they could have maybe 30% more cash flow if they had somebody who was trained to do that and who did that every day long, you know, all day long for other doctors as well. Absolutely. So my staff was there to make me happy. What I really wanted to do was take good care of patients. And so if, you know, if my office staff needed to schedule somebody for an emergency consultation with the oncologist or radiation oncologist, I mean, that took priority over following up on billing. That's the way I wanted it. That reflected the core value and culture of my practice. And so, you know, it always was towards the bottom of the to-do list, at least with my other partner. I wanted it to be important and I didn't want to have to manage it. I wanted, just like with my taxes, I wanted to hand it off to an expert knowing that they did this job day in and day out. So they were going to get great results. Another reason the second reason that I was so glad that I outsourced my billing was that I wanted to create checks and balances to prevent fraud and theft. So if you look at all professions, it turns out that healthcare is one of the most targeted for fraud and theft. And it makes sense. I mean, when Willie Sutton was asked, why do you rob banks? He said, that's where the money is. So if somebody wants to do something that's not quite on the up and up, this is a great place to do it. So I will tell you that I think that the reason that the first office manager quit was that she had actually been embezzling in the practice. And we started taking a more careful look at billing because I was asking questions. I wanted to know, how do I get paid? And I think wow. she sort of knew that she was getting caught. So all of the worrisome signs were there. Like she never took any vacation day. She was always the first there and the last to leave. And, you know, I really do think that she knew that her game was up. And, and then the other funny thing that happened was we hired a temp while we were interviewing people. And a couple of weeks after the temp left, the temp agency called us and said, hey, listen, we got some bad news for you. It turns out that that temp that we had sent to your office was a convicted Medicare felon. So this nice oh, lady goodness. had been out in the office helping the little old ladies fill out their paperwork. And probably what she was doing was stealing their financial information. So the temp agency says, you might wanna just kind of take a look at your billing um, to, to look for any irregularities. And it was sort of like, it's such a big mess. How could we possibly find irregularities? So I like the idea of keeping honest people honest. 
And creating a safe system just makes sense. You build in checks and balances, just like we build in checks and balances into the structure of our government. It just makes sense. So having the person who sends out the bills and, and who basically takes a look at all the accounting at the end of the month makes better sense than having somebody send out the bills, take the money and, uh, you know, make a banking deposit. I, I know a buddy who had her entire retirement embezzled by her office manager, and it was gone before she suspected that there was a problem. Oh my so, gosh, I yeah. can't even imagine. You know, I, I bet most people on here today, Dr. Vicki, can't really relate to the fact that doctors do deal with uh, this type of thing, fraud and theft uh, amongst their own uh, uh, people sometimes in their own office. So. Another good reason to outsource your billing to get all that financial information into the hands of professionals who, again, know what they're doing and are not there to steal or they can't because with our cloud based system, the doctor has full access to all the stuff that's going on, you know. Yeah. And, and here's something else that I really like. I actually like the idea that my biller had some financial skin in the game. Like we both wanted to optimize our revenue, right? And when right. she did her job well, both of us benefited. And I think that that's the way it should be. I think that's a great incentive. And, you know, I, I would hire my staff. I, I actually paid on the upper end of the salary curve, but still they saw the discrepancy between what they made and what I made. And I always yes. sort of wondered, what, what were they thinking? What were they thinking yeah. about me? What were they thinking about? you know, the importance of following up on collections. Yeah, any owner of a business or CEO does not necessarily want to know, uh, have everybody below them know what they're making, even though they may be making 10 times as much money, uh, people are just valued at different levels because of what they do, right? The value to the company. And so you don't necessarily want other people to know that because that leads to all sorts of problems uh, in their own minds about what they should do. For example, uh, an office biller might not be so concerned about you collecting 100% or 98% of what's owed to a doctor because they think, oh, that doctor's driving a Mercedes and living in a nice home and, you know, they don't need any uh, extra money. So they just don't put in as much effort. Now, when it's outsourced, though, to like one of our licensees who are trained to do the billing, they're making a percentage of everything that's collected. So they've got a real incentive there to collect as much as possible. Absolutely. And th that's why I think it just plain old makes sense. Yeah. Here's a quote I found uh, from the doctor patient medical association foundation. It says two out of three doctors say they're just squeaking by or in the red financially. That that's, that's, that's because of what we're going through right now. I think in, in healthcare, don't you think Dr. Vicki, I, uh, well, all the regulations and rules and changes. What I think the problem is Patrick, is that we physicians just don't have the skills and tools to know how to make this healthcare system work for us. I mean, yeah. business people can find a business opportunity no matter what's going on in the economy. But many doctors, you know, most of them have never taken a basic finance or business or marketing course. And right. so many of them just kind of feel like victims of all of the changes, not realizing what they could do to really find the opportunities in today's healthcare system. And there is opportunity. Uh, that's why we've been around for 25 years because we're, we're supplying a need. You know, one of the secrets uh, that I heard about many, many years ago was uh, the secret to success is uh, find a need and fill it. And uh, that's what our licensees are doing because they're, they're helping, they're truly helping doctors to, uh, improve their financial situation. All right, let's go into number three here. The doctors uh, need to minimize their risk of medical malpractice lawsuits and pay your audits. You want to touch on, uh, well, I know there's malpractice lawsuits. Some of that probably has to do with uh, patients not being happy with the way you, you build them. Absolutely. So let me just ask people on the line, how would you feel if you got a little note from the IRS saying, why don't you come on in and let's take a look at your tax returns. It probably would not be a great day for you. Now, <laughs> multiply that by 10 or by 100. 
And that's the doctor's experience when they're sued for medical malpractice or they find out that they're going to be the target of a payer audit. I mean, these are life altering episodes. Now, most doctors are going to get sued. And part of it has to do with our medical legal climate. I've been sued myself and I prevailed. But as my lawyer said to me, even when you win, you lose just because of the <laughs> effort that it takes. So if you talk with lawyers and you ask them, you know, why do patients call you and want to sue their doctors? They don't say things like, well, I had a bad outcome and I think that the doctor violated the standard of care. No, what you hear is the doctor didn't respond to me. And in fact, when it comes right down to it, a lot of patients who are unhappy with their bill and who are unable to get a bill billing issue clarified, those are the people that wind up suing. So if you can if doctors can treat their patients with respect and listen to them even if a patient has a bad outcome they're not necessarily going to sue conversely though if you've got an unhappy patient or an unhappy employee they will also point the finger at you and cause bad things to happen um so if you want to minimize your risks you want to take a look at well providing good medical care, but also take a look at things that are on the periphery of the delivery of care. And a big part of that is billing. So if you outsource your billing, you've basically got an expert who is there to pay attention to this very issue. So if there are some conflicts, if there's a question about it, man, I didn't want to take my office manager away from patient care to attend to that billing, but I wanted a complaint about billing taking care of urgently. And the person who did my billing was able to do that. Well, let's let's talk about the payer audits. What's that all about? What, what does that mean? Oh, okay. So let me just give you a little history. Um, up until pretty recently, up until the Affordable Care Act legislation was changed, the amount of money that Medicare paid to individual physicians was a big secret. Only Medicare knew. But with the Affordable Care Act, there was a freedom of information piece to that. And so suddenly, the amount that Medicare paid to individual physicians was a matter of public record. And as people started looking at these records, what they found is that a very large percentage of the Medicare dollars went to a very small percentage of doctors. And the assumption was that those doctors were engaged in some kind of fraudulent activity. So what does the government do? They said, well, let's find these doctors and let's recover our money. So believe it or not, they hired like this uh, network of kind of bounty hunters. And they said, look, if you can find Medicare fraud, you're gonna get a fraction of what we recover. So suddenly now more and more doctors are under scrutiny. Now in the US penal system, you're assumed innocent until proven guilty. But right. if you come under scrutiny for, for billing fraud, you are assumed guilty and it's very difficult to prove yourself innocent. So this can be a life changing event. This is, I mean, I cannot tell you the horror that this means. Um, not only is Medicare or a biller coming into your office, but word gets out, right? Suddenly you're that doctor who's not upholding professional or ethical standards. It is an absolute nightmare. So the question is, why do doctors get audited? And usually it's because of outliers. You know, Medicare knows what you're billing. They know what the guy down the hall is billing and the guy across town is billing. I only know what I'm billing though. But with an outsourced biller, they have a sense of what the community standard is. They can identify who the outliers are. And I just kind of felt like that was an added layer of protection that kept me where I wanted to be. I mean, I 
I wanted to be honest. I didn't want to shortchange myself, but I certainly didn't want to do anything illegal or unethical, something that would trigger one of those audits because it's hard to recover from that. Yeah. Well, and like you said, the fines are pretty heavy on those too. You know, one of the things our licensees have, by the way, folks, is we have something that no other medical billing uh, companies out there have, and that is what's called Audit Guard. That's an ancillary program that's a part of your license when you purchase uh, our package, but it's included in it, but you can offer this uh, to doctors that guards them against those audits by preparing ahead of time and doing a what we call a pre-audit. So just keep that in mind. That's one of the things that uh, that we have. Okay, we got to move on here because we're halfway through the hour and uh, we're number four. Doctors need uh, to build their ideal practice. So, right. uh, you know, I put out a little note here. Some, some doctors think they need to main control over their billing inside their own office uh, and, and do it in-house. But that's not ideal, really, is it? Well, doctors want to be in control, period. And you probably yeah. want doctors who want to be in control because they want to control the variables so the patients get good outcomes, right? But the question right. is, what's really the best way to be in control? Is it by keeping your billing in-house or is it by outsourcing it? And for me, this is a no-brainer. I was more in control when I outsourced my billing. But I also think that outsourcing my billing gave me more control about my practice growth too. Look, the reality was that I worked a certain number of hours, I generated a certain income, so each clinical activity generated an hourly rate. It also generated different levels of rewards. So if you want to build your practice, what you want to do is spend most of your time doing the things that you really love to do that make the most financial sense. And so how did I tease that out? How did I decide that I wanted to become a breast surgeon, for example? Well, part of it happened organically. But the other thing was that it was just a prudent business direction to take my practice because this turned out to be a very lucrative way of me to invest my time. I earned a high hourly salary for that. And how did I know that? Well, I had my outsourced biller who was able to run reports and take a look at where my cash flow was coming from. And so with her help, it made it easier to target certain activities that, well, actually I lost money doing. Like every time I took out an appendix of somebody who was on Medicaid or public assistant, I didn't meet my overhead. I, lo I actually lost money. And then there were some others that were, were very, very profitable. And it's not like I just cared about profit. I mean, I donated my time to uh, volunteer at the free clinic. But if I could do this in a smart way, I would have more fun when I came to work and I would know that I would be able to leave work without worrying about how to pay back, you know, my medical school debt. Well, that, that's true of any business. Uh, you know, you have more profitable products and services and you eliminate the ones that uh, don't make you uh, the profit that you need to make to stay in business. So that just makes sense from a business standpoint. I, I do the same thing in our business. We, we take away anything that's not profitable and add things that, that are, but uh, that's just normal. All right, let's go to number five. Doctors need to uh, ways to prevent uh, or uh, treat burnout. Talk to us about burnout. What do, what do you mean? Doctors are burned out on what? Uh, so burnout is basically toxic stress. So it's just feeling like the joy is gone. I mean, that's the phrase that I hear most often. I'm just not having fun anymore get me out of here. Like, what do I need to do to move up retirement by five to 10 years? What do I do if I want to hang up my white coat? And as you might imagine, if you've got a doctor in private practice who's losing 30% of their income, now think about, think about how you generate revenue. What if somehow you lost 30% of that, it didn't come home? Um, you would be kind of unhappy too. So toxic stress or burnout is the situation in which this stress actually erodes the quality of life. 
So it's hard to get reconnected to joy. It, it's hard to sort of see energy. Well, let's put it like this. You don't get recharged. You see a lot of time and energy and resources going out, but self-nurturing just isn't there. Now, we are seeing epidemic levels of physician burnouts, and it just keeps on getting worse. When doctors are surveyed and they're asked, what's the cause of your burnout? Money is often one of the top three answers. When they're asked, what would you need in order to turn around burnout? Money is one of the top three answers too. So ABS licensees can both prevent burnout by helping doctors really spend their time doing the things that they really love to do. And they can turn around burnout when they can recover all of this money that's just being left on the exam table. Yeah, and, and so uh, somebody that I know is writing a book on burnout for doctors. <laughs> yes, I believe I know that person. Yeah, <laughs> this, this is a That's hot a you have topic. On the drawing board, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Bur- go ahead, I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead, Patrick. Oh, well, I just needed to move on here. And uh, Eric, I just want to make sure that Eric is still on here. I might need him to take over here just in a second. I've got something yeah, that's come up here. Yeah. I need to. All right, then you just take over with number six there and I'll I'll, I'll, I'll return here just a, shortly. You bet. Right. Okay. So uh, Dr. Wagner, obviously we're on number six here and doctors need to manage their staff and issues to assure their practice runs smoothly. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, that's that's, that's got to be huge for you. It really is. So I was a small office. You know, I only had one employee and I hired just lovely, lovely office people that my patients loved. But I don't know if it was just me, but boy, it just seemed like there were a lot of days when I just didn't have the staff there. Sometimes, you know, people get sick, right? Right. Um, One of my employees, Maxine, everyone loved Maxine. Her husband was a Boeing employee, and when there was a shutdown, they had to move. So I lost Maxine. You know, another decided to sort of um, be a family caregiver for the mother-in-law. So stuff happened. And I understand that. People need vacation. And I can hire temps, but the thing is that I never wanted my cash flow to suffer because something happened to my staff. Right. So if, I, if I'm hearing, because I've been in the background listening to everything, you know, having someone like an outsourced medical billing company uh, sounds like it brings a lot of stability to you as a doctor, to the staff, to, you know, a lot of you know, the, the, every, everything that works there in that doctor's office. Uh, and I know this question hasn't come up yet. It may come up. But uh, did you ever feel like any of your staff ever felt like... Um, since you had it outsourced, that they felt threatened at all? Uh, well, I, I think our initial um, staff person was threatened, and I, I believe that it was because she was embezzling. Right. Um, but the, the truth is that looking at the way I conducted my practice, at least, patient care came first. Yes. And by outsourcing my billing and the business side, we were able to focus on patient care. And I think that that helped me create the culture that I wanted in my practice. You know, that's a, that's a great word, you know, creating a certain culture within your office. And, and, I'm a, and I know it with the doctors that I see, I, I know if, if I go to the doctor and they're just really, really, really busy and they are, uh, they think, uh, I, I'm not going to have a lot of time to spend with you, Eric. I know that as a patient, but those doctors that do have their billing taken care of properly, like, you know, some of the, the what we're showing right here, that that brings a lot of comfort to me as a patient. So you're right. It creates the kind of culture that you want for your patients. That helps the staff completely. What we're showing here is just that this this tablet here or this table showing the the, the really the cost comparison for doing an in-house billing versus outsourcing. And Eric, with, I will say respectfully, I think this is actually missing the point. 
I mean, <laughs> as a doctor, what I wanted to know is how much money is going to be in my checking account at the end of the month yep. uh, with billing in-house or billing outsourced. Okay, so I needed to make an owner investment when my in-house billing went off track, right? That's pretty yeah. bad. And if the average doctor is walking away from 30% of their revenue, so let's just do a little number right now. The average orthopedic surgeon in America starts out at about $500,000. So that income is after the expenses are already taken out. So they're billing like 800,000 a right. year. Okay, 30% of 800,000, that's a very big number. And, well, and go ahead. No, you, you, I, that's, that's what the people on the call need to hear about is why would a doctor even think about outsourcing? Obviously, we can see a little bit of it here, but you, you took it from a different angle. You took it as that, that business doctor ownership and how much money that they're actually losing. And, and I'm going to ask you to re-say that again, just simply because you said it so eloquently, but I don't know if everybody caught it. You're saying that a doctor at any time could be losing up to 30% of their income because their billing is possibly in-house. That's right. So Patrick tells this great story when he was first starting out in the billing business. So mm -hmm. his doctor invited him in and opened up a drawer and there were a collection of unopened rejected insurance claims. He said right. to Patrick, I call this my Porsche drawer because I knew that if somebody in the office just followed up on these claims, I would get my dream car. That's right. Yeah. Daniel uh, Elliott is asking, so when you when you outsourced your billing, did you outsource to ABS? Well, I don't think ABS was around whenever you were doing that 30 years ago. That's right. I, I'm a dinosaur, so no. <laughs> I would have put them in a heartbeat had I known them. That was a great question, Daniel. I mean, that was really good. Uh, but uh, yeah, that, that's that's awesome. Okay, Eric, I'm sorry. I, 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 uh, I'm back. I just wanted to thank you for kind of filling in there for me. Uh, well, yeah. this, this chart is just showing basically that if you do outsource, uh, you could be uh, saving money over, you know, keeping it in house. But let's move on to that next, uh, next point, Dr. Vicki. Doctors need to protect the privacy of the patients and themselves and avoid HIPAA violations. So I think everybody on here probably has uh, some knowledge of HIPAA. You want to explain why that's a can be uh, dangerous for a doctor to violate HIPAA rules? You bet. Okay, so HIPAA um, is basically a law that says patients have a right to their medical privacy. And you sign HIPAA forms every time you go and see the doctor. Okay, so I heard this story that just sent shivers up and down my spine. So this office manager took her laptop on vacation with her she lost it, it got stolen, which is always a pain, but Thanks. there were patient records, unsecured patient records on her computer, and there was a $250,000 fine per each unsecured medical record, $250,000. Oh so this that is serious ruin business. Your, that this could ruin is, your day. <laughs> that that could ruin your retirement. <laughs> so uh, yeah. everyone knows theoretically that we want to do what we can to protect our patients' information. But then, you know, sometimes just the little details get lost. Like, how do I secure this thumb drive? And, you know, one practice that's really, really important for doctors is to upload oh. their data onto the cloud. So it's not on some office manager's um, laptop that could be stolen. I mean, if you just Google HIPAA violations, you're going to see medical organizations with millions of dollars in fines for this. This is something that's really, really important. The other thing about privacy is, I don't know if you've noticed this, but people gossip. <laughs> and <laughs> to be quite honest, I just didn't want my office staff gossiping in the cafeteria about what was going on in the office. I just, I wanted to keep that private and I thought the best way to keep it private was to just, you know, not let everyone have access to the information. 
Yeah, get it out of the office, right. Well, and people don't realize it. Uh, there are companies who sell software still that uh, comes on a, a CD or a DVD that installs on the hard disk of the computer in the doctor's office. And there's where the danger comes in. Like you said, uh, a computer could be stolen out of a doctor's office or that data downloaded and all of a sudden that 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 privacy is gone for those patients. Yeah, so and you're reading, about, a, yeah. you're reading about it in the local paper too. Yeah, that's yeah. right. That doesn't do so good that's, practices. So that's one of the things that uh, our licensees have access to. Another one of our ancillary services, Compliancy Guard, which can guarantee that the doctor is not going to be caught, uh, you know, with some of those violations uh, of HIPAA rules and regulations. So, anyway, folks, all of these things are included in your your package if you join us as a licensee. But you need to ask your uh, business coach, the person that you've been talking to here at ABS about these and they can go into more details because we can't cover them in detail in the uh, in the uh, slides today. All right, let's go to number eight. Doctors um, need to identify and uh, utilize their dream team. Does that include the people that uh, are actually uh, doing their billing inside their office or outside their office? They're kings and queens as far as I'm concerned in the dream team because you can't run a practice unless you're generating revenue. You can't do anything unless you're generating revenue. So that piece has to be taken care of. Now, when I think of doctors doing their billing in-house, I sort of wonder, well, are they gonna go to LegalZoom to you know, cover themselves for medical malpractice? Or are they gonna do TurboTax for their taxes? I mean, I sort of felt like I was dealing with sophisticated, complex problems. And I wanted, members of the dream team who would all bring their expertise, as I said, to help me achieve the levels of performance I wanted in my practice. Well, and there's also the point I think you make in the book about uh, the fact that they need to, uh, some doctors need to actually market their practice to keep patients on board because patients die and they move away and they go to other doctors. And, and so that's part of uh, your dream team, I guess somebody that, that, but they don't usually have anybody in the office that, that does any focus on that, I don't guess. Um, they don't, although more and more physicians are. Um, we used to say the whole world is pre-op and now this is kind of true. I mean, patients travel miles and miles to have say surgical procedures. And yeah. so you can create a brand, a, an individual physician can create a brand, nurture that brand through social media and really have the kind of practice that they want. Now it takes sets of skills. And so you go out and you solicit people with those skills who are gonna help you get to where you want to go. Yeah, and again, another one of the services our licensees can offer to the doctors is called AutoCard which can be set up so that it actually is a marketing tool for the doctor. That is, it reaches out to the people who uh, come to them in their community and uh, sends a uh, literally a printed postcard or greeting card that tells the, the people about the practice and maintains their patient base, reminding patients to come back in for checkups and immunizations and things like that. So again, another great tool that our licensees have. All right, we've got to move on here. Number nine, doctors need to make the codes work for them in legal and ethical ways. Now, I know that in the book, you talk about the, the tax code and how important that is and uh, keeping the, the, the doctor up on the tax stuff. But let's talk about the medical codes just for this point, Dr. Vicki. Medical codes, you might explain that to people, what those are and why those are so important that they, they utilize them correctly. All right, so the way the doctor gets paid is they say, okay, this patient has this diagnosis code and here's the procedure code for the care that I delivered in the office in the operating room. So these codes get sent to the insurance companies and your, the amount that you get paid is a function of these codes. So choosing the right code is important. You don't wanna shortchange yourself um, if you're dealing with a very complex patient, you don't want to code them as a simple patient, but yet you don't want to overcode. Right. So there is a whole new set of codes that came out, well, 
pretty recently. Um, it's been in the works for a while, but because of the complexity, it actually took a while to get it rolled out. And once this set of codes increased in complexity, there's this question, am I, am I choosing the right code? So doctors who kept their billing in-house were going out to their medical societies, quickly trying to get on board and get some experience with how to use the new codes. And I get that. But what I want is I want to go to the experts. I want to go to the expert who does this coding day in and day out so that they know how to use the new codes because they're doing it full time. And right. knowing how to use the codes really does make a difference. It's kind of like if you're dealing with Legos. I mean, you can have certain Legos, but depending on the skill of the Lego maker, you can really make something magnificent or you can make something that doesn't do very well. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, I've thrown up here another one of the ancillary services that our licensees are able to offer to doctors that we employ uh, certified medical coders. So if you're wondering if you need to know about coding or be a coder, the answer is no, because uh, you can offer this service through our, our coders to the doctor that can improve their re reimbursement rates, uh, like we said earlier, up to 30%, because again, with the accurate codes, sometimes they're under coding. And uh, just like they can overcode and get fined for that, they can undercode and, and leave money on the table. Uh, then there's also this, uh, our codes are actually all built in. All of those codes you just mentioned, Dr. Vicki, the newest ones, the ICD-10s are built into our cloud-based system and updated regularly. So they're always up to date. Uh, there's no downloading and installing new codes or anything like that. You don't have to learn anything because they're there for the doctor to use on his or her uh, iPad when they're visiting with the patient and it suggests the codes from ICD-10 that they should be using. So it's it's really a, a cool uh, cool way to keep up with all that code stuff that's going on out there. All right, let's see. I think we're on number 10 here, aren't we? Yeah, let's, uh, let's jump to number 10 here. I think I can get that on the screen here. Uh, yeah, there it is. Okay. All right. So one why day... Need to optimize, why do they need to optimize the sale of price? sale price of their practice. That, well, right. That's obvious. They want to get as much money as they can if they do sell. A absolutely. So doctors who are in private practice do know that they want to retire one day. They're investing their sweat equity, not just to generate revenue for today, but with the knowledge that one day they're going to retire and somebody's going to buy their practice. And, you know, you can go online and take a look at the kinds of numbers that we're talking about. But let's say, you know, a thriving plastic surgeon wants to sell their practice. This can be a seven figure sale. So how is the buyer going to decide what to pay the doctor when they retire? Well, a lot of it has to do with is this practice a viable concern? You know, is everything in place? Is all the staffing in place? But at the end of the day, this is a numbers game. So what they pay for is the chance to go in and have certainty that they're going to experience a certain level of revenue from the day they start. And th these are big numbers. I mean, these are very big numbers. And yeah. when a doctor can get all of this in place, like five or 10 years before they retire, they're going to get a much, much better sale price for their practice. Now, remember, 40% of practicing physicians are age 50 or older. So there are doctors who are gonna be handing off practices now. And so I know one of the ABS licensees who used to do real estate appraise, appraisals. And part of his message to doctors when he's promoting the ABS services is here, let me help you get your practice in shape to optimize the sale price. Yeah, that's uh, that would be important to me. If I were selling uh, a business, I would say, you know what? Uh, why work so hard all these years and get, you know, just a little dab when I could get more? 
And again, the reports that you can give to a doctor from our cloud-based system gives the information that they need for that. Dr. Vicki, I'm gonna wrap up here and let uh, Eric take over. Uh, I've got another call coming up myself uh, here at five o'clock. So thank you for your time today. I appreciate you being on here. My pleasure. Thanks so much for the opportunity to tell my story. Okay, thanks again. Bye for Bye -bye. now. Thanks for